All right, we're gonna take a look now at using Gauss's law when there's a spherical symmetry. So you'll have some kind of a charge density where the charge density is maybe changing just with radius, but say not with, not with angle, because then that would throw off some symmetry. Um, so you just have something where there's uh, like this, where it says the charge density goes like R squared. So maybe it starts out relatively uncharged or no charge in the very center. And then the amount of charge grows and grows and grows. And then the very outside edge, there would be a whole bunch of, of charge there. And then once you're outside the ball, then it's gone. So uh, just a configuration of charge that has what's called spherical symmetry. So let's take a look at using uh, Gauss's law. And the way these problems usually go is you're supposed to find the electric field everywhere. Right? Well, so if you first put down Gauss's law, um, one way to write it is like this. It's uh, E dot dA which is actually the flux through a, the electric flux through a closed surface that you come up with, any closed surface, uh, equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Okay. Now what I typically will sh show my students is if you're smart enough with how you choose your Gaussian surface, ultimately this ends up collapsing down to uh, Ea per. So in other words, E times whatever area you present perpendicular to that field. Um, so we'll tend to use it like this. And so if we come back to the problem, we're supposed to find E everywhere. So um, what, what's going to happen is we're going to have to divide this up into two regimes, inside the ball and outside the ball. Um, why is that? Well, inside the ball, you have a charge density that's uh, you're accumulating uh, more and more charge as you go out. So in other words, the amount of charge your Gaussian surface would contain will change while you're within here. Once you're outside the ball, the amount of um, charge that you capture is not going to change as you move out. And as a matter of fact, you're just going to get a field like a point charge when you're outside. Um, so let's take a look at how that plays out. Um, so what we're going to first do is go inside of the ball. Right? So when you're inside the ball, the Gaussian surface that you're going to want to choose is going to be just a sphere. Um, it's going to, you want to match the symmetry. And you want to make it easy for you to calculate this integral and basically have it collapse into Ea per. So the problem with choosing a square here is the problem is the field is pointing radial. And so to be perpendicular to that field, you want to have a, a sphere. If you draw a cube or something in here, um, the problem is the field is not always going to be perpendicular to the surface of the cube, and so your um, the flux will be much harder to um, calculate. Okay, but this will be easy if we choose a sphere, um, because since the field is going to be radial, you have to imagine this electric field pointing radially in all directions, including out. Um, if you're the same distance away from the center, which means on the surface of a ball, or then the, the strength of the field will be constant, so it'll be some value E that we're going to calculate, and then the area of that um, the area of that ball is going to be four pi little r squared. Right now, why are we using the little r? That's because the what we want is the flux through our Gaussian surface, right? Everything in Gauss's law pertains to the Gaussian surface you made up. This is the flux through your Gaussian surface. This is the charge enclosed by your Gaussian surface. Um, so with spherically symmetric problems, the left side of Gauss's law is just going to be this all the time because you'll just choose spheres for your Gaussian surface. The labor generally comes in with calculating the enclosed charge. right? So a way to think about it is just by logic, enclosed charge is always the sum of the little bits of charge. And then you just need to think about how you want to uh, get the little bits of charge. So what we're going to do is a little side project um, to figure out how much charge is inside this ball. Okay. When you have a situation where there's only a radial dependence, the, um, what you're going to tend to want to do is have your little chunk of, of uh, charge that you look at, your little chunk of charge is actually going to be like a spherical shell. So I'm going to draw like a little shell here. I'm, I'm exaggerating the thickness of the shell. Um, so here's the shell. In fact, I guess I'll just color it in so it's easier to see on the, on the movie. This is supposed to be a, a little shell of that's supposed to be infinitely thin, but I, I drew it in a way that you could see it. Um, and so what we, what we want to do is to get the amount of, of charge that's in this little shell. So that's what I'm going to call DQ, is a chunk of charge that's shaped like a shell. 
And then what we're going to do is add up all the shells until we get to the, out, the outer part. So the way to see what to do is we'll say, well, DQ is a little chunk of charge. And what that is going to be is, since it's charge, it's going to be charge per volume times a volume. Right? Well, the charge per volume we're given, it's, it's the charge density. Right? This is what the charge per volume is. Um, so that's going to be um, R squared. Okay, and then the volume is the volume of this infinitely thin shell, right? Well, how would you get a, the volume of something? It would be the area of the shell times how thick it is. Like the area of the eggshell, let's say, times how thick the eggshell is. Well, the area of this ball is going to be 4 pi little r squared. That's the area of that ball. Um, and then the thickness of the ball would just be a little wiggle, a little excursion in R, in the radial coordinate. Um, so that's going to be dr. Okay, so as long as there's no angular dependence with what's going on, you can, get a, you can find a total charge like this. You'll be able to use that as your volume element, okay, as your dv. So one thing I could have written here is charge per volume is generally rho and then dv. So this says charge is charge per volume times volume, and that's always going to be the case. Well, now we have an expression for dq, and so we're now we're actually ready to add them up. Um, so I'm going to do a little side project here to get the, the sum of all the dqs. So to sum all the dqs, that's going to be the sum of all the, well, let's just put, put, substitute this for dq. So you'll get 4 pi r to the fourth dr. And then what we want to do is integrate from 0 to... Now, now how, much of, how many of these things do we want to collect? A mistake students will make sometimes is they'll integrate all the way out to big R. But we don't want to do that because what we want to do is find the charge that's just enclosed by this Gaussian surface here. Okay, by this spherical Gaussian surface. Here, maybe I'll, I'll just bold it in with the red. Right? What we're trying to do is figure out how much charge is within our Gaussian surface because that's what Gauss's law is always referring to. So you want to go zero to little r here. Um, the total charge is going to actually depend on R. The amount of charge you enclose should depend on how big your Gaussian surface is in here. Um, so let's do this. You get, um, well, R to the fourth will integrate to R to the fifth over five. So you're going to get uh, four pi times R to the fifth over five. So that is the charge enclosed. That's your QA, or your integral of dQ. And so then let's just substitute that back in. So you've got e times 4 pi r squared equals um, 1 over epsilon naught and then times 4 pi r to the fifth over 5. Well, we just need to divide over to get the answer here. So the 4 pi's will cancel. And the r squared is going to come under and reduce that to a cube. So you're going to get the field strength is going to be um, well, these constants, 1 over 5 epsilon naught, and then it's going to grow like r cubed. And I'm just going to kind of isolate the r dependence. So that's the strength of the field. Why should the field get stronger as I move out? Well, I'm, I'm enclosing more and more charge as I move out. Um, so that's accumulating rapidly. Um, and so e times 4 pi r squared equals this function that's growing like r to the fifth. So by the time you divide under, um, you get this result that the field grows like crazy. So what people will do to give indicate a direction, um, the field's going to point radially away. So you just say it's a vector, and it points in the r hat direction, which is just like away. It's a unit vector that points away. Um, so there is your field inside. I'll just put in e in is that right? When you go to get the field outside. What you want to do then is have your Gaussian surface be outside. So now we're moving into the other regime, which is out here. So you draw another Gaussian surface, um, and you'll just rerun Gauss's law, right? So, so if, we're, if we're working on outside, um, let me just maybe write that here. We'll say outside. Now what you're going to see here is we don't have to repeat um, all of our work. Um, some, we'll just have to make a few changes. So left-hand side of Gauss's law, it's going to be E times the area you're presenting perpendicular to the field, which is still 
4 pi times the radius of your Gaussian sphere um, squared. 4 pi r squared is the area of your ball. So the left side of Gauss's law is the same, d times 4 pi r squared, equals, now q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now notice, when you're out here, the amount of charge you enclose will not depend on your, um, on your size of your Gaussian surface. So this would be q inc over epsilon naught. Now something I can do to just pause here or wrap something up quickly here is when you divide this under, you can, you can see that you're just going to get the field of, of a point charge. Um, so you're going to get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught um, times q inc over r squared kq over r squared. That's just the field due to a point charge. Um, now to get the, um, in terms of the given quantities though, we, we do need to get what the, the q enclosed is. Well, let's go back and look at our calculation for q enclosed. When we were within the ball, we were only trying to ac accumulate the charge out to where our Gaussian surface was. Now that we're, our Gaussian surface is outside the ball, we have now captured all the charge. So the, the only thing we need to modify for getting the enclosed charge in this case is instead of integrating from zero to little r, we need to go all the way out to the end of the, um, the cloud of charge. So we gotta go from zero to little r. A key issue here, okay, a mistake that students will make is they'll continue to integrate out to their new radius, but there's no charge out here. So you're gonna get some, you're gonna overcount charge if you do that. So what you want to do is cut off the integral once you get to um, the boundary. And so all you have to do is say, well, for, for the Q enclosed, we, we've, got the, we've already done the work for it. It's just we, we just need to integrate to big R. Go from 0 to big R of 4 pi R to the 4th dr. And so what you'll see is that'll give you 4 pi capital R to the 5th over 5. It's a constant. It does not, the enclosed charge does not depend anymore on the um, radius of your Gaussian sphere. And so then what we can do is just, it's just a matter of simply putting that in here to get like the final answer. Um, so let's do it. I guess this black is showing up well, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stick that in there like this. Um, oh, it's, I'm gonna run out of room. I'll just, I'll just finish it over here. So E equals, what do we got? One over four pi epsilon naught. Um, there's that r squared in there, 1 over r squared, and then we have to multiply by this guy, 4 pi big R to the fifth over 5. Um, it looks like just the 4 pi's go away, and so finally in all its glory we have E equals, what do we got? Up top we have r to the fifth, big R to the fifth. In the bottom we have 5 epsilon naught. Uh, and then we have the, the 1 over r squared dependence. Um, it falls off like 1 over r squared. You can expect that when you're outside of a, um, a cloud of charge, a sphere of charge. Um, it looks like a point charge once you get far away from the thing, or once you're even just outside of the ball um, at all. And then to vectorize it, you'd say, well, it's a vector, and it points away. Um, and so that's your field due to a, a cloud of charge that has a charge density that's growing quadratically.